Last night I got a call from one of my friends. He's um, a DJ on, on K-Love. You know K-Love? Anybody know K-Love? He's got like four million listeners. Scott, he's a buddy of mine from way back. And um, he texts me. First I texted him back. I said, aren't you working? You're right now on the radio. I'm listening. And he said, I was, I was crying all day, praying Ezekiel 37. What does that mean? What does that mean? And he was praying about the dry bones, and the Lord was moving on his heart to pray for revival because he knows when the Lord comes back, he's not coming back as the baby in the manger. You know, the fire in his eyes and the sword in his mouth is not a good thing. People sing about it, but they're singing wrong. I don't mean to be technical, but they're singing. Oh, you know, they, it's, it's a festive song, and, and, and he's coming back. When, when a person has fire in their eyes and a sword in their mouth, it's not a good thing. So he's coming back to judge. And then he texts me back. He said, even the elect will be deceived, right, Rabbi? And I said, that's the worst part of it. That's the worst part of it. Yeah. To, to, to run so far and so hard and then give up at the end is crazy. Right? Um, I'm going to finish the Torah portion that I didn't finish last week, but I want to tell you a couple of things um, First, you know, with, with uh, Bernadette and the kids being away for two weeks, um, I had to cut the lawn because Max isn't here. And I washed the cars yesterday because Shane and Lily aren't here. And then I actually did a wash, which I haven't done in over 30 years. And it's kind of easy. You put the stuff in the machine and you press a button. And then, and then you take them out and you put them in another machine and you, you press another button. But when it came out of that machine, then I realized now, now it gets a little dicey because you actually had to fold it and put it away. And that was, that was boring. That was boring. Um, I didn't go out to eat at all. I cooked every night. And, um, and that was nice. It was nice to sit with the Lord at my table. And he's always at my table, but it was nice to have nobody else there. Um, I want to read to you something from Neve Mpechel. You, you wear Neve Mpechel. The, the beautiful thing about this ministry, I just, that, you know, you look around and it's, you know, it's just you and me and we're no big deal, right? But the crazy thing is Jason from our technology department just gave me a list. There's 370 cities right now in the United States that are listening, which is kind of nuts if you think about it. I mean, but the neat thing about that, let me tell you what's neat. Not that they're listening to me. That's not it. It's that a lot of these people are going to our website and they're helping out our ministries directly. Like, for instance, Neve Michael just received a check from a guy for $10,000. And they're able to do so much more because the guy that, that, that you see, Neve Michael can't pay. Um, a funds ra- fundraisers, fundraisers want minimally six figures. If they're going to raise funds for you, they want 150 plus bonuses. They can't afford that, so they're caught between a rock and a hard place. And, and the man who's a friend of mine who's been raising their funds for, for them is 99 years old. A 90-year-old Jewish man from Fort Lauderdale. And a lot of times he, he can't get the synagogues, the traditional synagogues. And he always says to me, Rabbi Greg, somebody sent $5,000 from Wyoming. How, what's going on? And I said, Jack, his name is Jack Strumfeld. They're going to the website. They, they see it's a, a beautiful ministry. And they're sending it direct. I don't, I don't care. I'm, ha- I'm happy. So Hava, who runs it, and if you're going to Israel with us this, this year, you'll go to the... Many of you have gone to Nevin Pale, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's an unbelievable ministry. But this is what she wrote. Dear Rabbi Greg, Beth Yeshua, friends, Shalom. I want you to know how much Neve Michael appreciates what you continue to do, so I thought I would share several very special things going on at Neve Michael. You will understand even better why working there makes my day. It's a gift. Recently, we hosted 70 children from a nonprofit organization that takes chronically, terminally sick children away for weekends now and then in order to give the families a break. We did this as our gift to the children. Two weeks ago, our children in the Sulamot Philharmonic program performed in Tel Aviv. This is some of the greatest musicians in the world. It's a miracle when one remembers why these kids came to them. Neve Michael, these kids are taken out of their houses because they are abused to the nth degree. Some people think, does that happen in Israel? Human beings are human beings. And sin is sin. It doesn't take on a color or a religion. It's a heart issue. And so this is an incredible place. I'm so proud of them. 
This is a special music therapy. These, these are kids who are so shell-shocked. You, 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 some of them, you can't talk to them right away. It takes months and years sometimes. Listen to this. Our young teenage group is continuing to help weekly Holocaust survivors in Israel, buying them food, cleaning their homes, taking them for walks, going to the doctor, and just sitting around and talking to them. Our children have bonded with these survivors, and Holocaust Day now has a different meaning for them. Some will be coming to the big bar mitzvah we will have at the end of June as our guests of honor. A few weeks ago, I hosted a lovely group of young adult girls with special needs, 18 years and up, all from abroad, meaning outside the country. It was moving and meaningful, especially to see how our children welcomed them. And next week, a group of Neve Michael children were chosen to go to Euro Disney. Make a Wish Israel is taking 50 very sick children, each with a chaperone and a medical staff. There was a request that the children at risk come as well to help the sick children and to be their buddies during the journey. At the end of August, we are going to be taking in an additional 35 boys and girls who cannot live at home. I am lucky because I work at a place where love and care are always there. Some days I get endless hugs, and I'm grateful that I'm doing something worthwhile. Remember what I always tell you? Doctrine can't do this. This is where the rubber meets the road for the Lord. And our children are lucky to have wonderful people like Beth Yeshua who enable us to make that difference. I'm so happy that you are a part of the Neve Hill family. Thank you. God bless. Hava Levine. It's great stuff, man. I just, uh, I don't tell you this to, it's not boasting. I want to encourage you. There's nothing like giving of yourself, whether it's your time, finances. If you're unhappy, find somewhere that you can give of yourself. This is the, Mother Teresa said, this is the antidote for depression. The antidote. And, and I agree with her. Um, I get a lot of these emails from time to time, but I feel compelled to read this one. Dearest Rabbi, um, I feel so blessed to be a part of Beth Yeshua these 10 years. What my wife and I have learned through years beyond words. Um, I appreciate you allowing me to sit up front sometimes. I can hear fine, but it's the distractions and the cell phones and the talking that I hate. Um, let me explain something to you, okay? I like some things about the South. For one, I like the respectability, the decorum. There is a respectability. When I first got here and Jeremy was in the supermarket, I didn't know where he was, so what did I do? Jeremy! And somebody who knew me said, Rabbi, you can't yell. And I go, no, no, I, I can. I just, look, I just did. <laughs> and they said, no, in the South, we don't, we don't really yell like that. And I was like, really? Why not? But there's a decorum here, right? If you've been other places, the decorum, I like it. I stopped going to movies because people now talk in the movie theater. They talk. They, they're on their phone, which lights up. I almost got into a fist fight, not my part, but I, I said to a guy, he was with his girl, and you could tell, he was tatted, he was like 23, he had arms the size of legs, you know, but I couldn't, he was talking to her, and I just said, excuse me, I, my wife and I can't hear, you know, Mike, you're with me, right, remember, and I knew the guy was going to bow up, because God forbid, even if you're respectable today, everybody's so insecure and uptight, they're so froggy, they're just ready to leap, for what, I, I was totally respectful, now, back in my day, the usher came in and escorted you out. You wouldn't even think about putting up a fight. You were like, oh, God, the ushers, you hid under the seat. Can you imagine trying to get an usher, some kid, to escort you out today? How would that end? Okay, let me explain something to you. If you want to talk, please leave the sanctuary. Don't ask, you know, don't let the, and Shamashim, please, don't, don't be embarrassed to ask them to stop talking. Okay? If they get offended by that, we know where their heart is. If they decide to leave and never come back, we know where their heart is. It's not rude to me. It's rude to your neighbor. They can't concentrate. Do you really have to be on your cell phone? What is so important? Hashtag boring? Just leave. You could talk out there. You could go outside. There's some nice benches. There's a park. There's a beautiful olive grove. I sit out by, I'm not telling you you have to leave, I'm just saying it's so inconsiderate to the person who's trying to listen. Do we follow? Yeah. Do we understand? Yeah. Is, it, is it clear? Yeah. I mean, and for some of you young people, just make believe I'm a video game and you'll be able to focus. Okay, um, it's an intense subject, we're, we're finishing up. Let me just go over three scriptures that we went over last week, okay, to refresh your memory. So let me go over the first three, Numbers 11, 1, and Numbers 12, 1 through 2, and Numbers 13. Remember we kind of covered these three chapters? 
And this was not my choosing. Now, this is a tough thing to teach because there's people that teach this to try to get a message across. Like all of a sudden, you know, offerings down. So what comes up next? Tithing. I don't do that. Okay? No more than I'm going to teach on why you shouldn't murder. It's pretty obvious. Or why you shouldn't commit adultery, right? Come on. I don't have to teach that. If the Holy Spirit can get you to stop, I'm not going to. Okay? I like to teach on, on different things, but we went over these three chapters. Now, just listen. Chapters 11, chapter 11, how long are they in their journey, the children of Israel? Three days. Three. They're, in a th- they're on their third day. Are we there yet? But the people began complaining about their hardships to Adonai. About their hardships, they were, they were just enslaved. Okay, then Numbers 12, so you got some of the people are complaining. Then Numbers 12... You've got what? The people closest to Moshe. Some of these people he didn't know. He didn't know all two million people. But his sister and brother. I mean, she helped protect him. Right? Now his own flesh and blood, the people closest to him are complaining. Right? And then you've got the negative report that was spread by the spies. By those who were going to survey the land. And they come out and they spread it. They didn't keep it with themselves. They spread it. Right? And then what happens? Numbers 14, 1 through 2. This 13, 32 is the end of the chapter. Remember, God didn't speak in chapters and verses. He just spoke. We broke up the chapters and verses for teaching purposes, and that's wisdom. But however, I just want you to see this is a continuum. Okay? 13, 32. We just ended that verse, and now this is what happens. Once the negative report got out to the people, at this, all the people of Israel cried out in dismay and wept all night long. They're wailing. They're wailing. Moreover, all the people of Israel began grumbling against Moshe and Aaron. The whole community told them, we wish we had died in the land of Egypt or that we had died here in the desert. Okay? Now, all of a sudden, in no time, all the people break out with a bit of complaint. Okay? You see the progression? Some of the people, then some of the leaders of the people, and then all of the people. That progression is the same today as it was 3,400 years ago. That's why my style of leadership is to nip things in the bud because things do not come out in the wash. They have to be pre-stained. And if you don't have a preemptive strike, you're looking at a war. Do you understand? Now, there's many times I extend mercy upon mercy upon mercy, and that fool will not stop. But this is the way it starts. Some of the people, then they get into leadership, and then those foolish leaders who are supposed to know better side with the people, and then once the leadership falls, then it's all of the people, then it's history. You follow? Let's see this word all for a minute, just so you know what it means, because some people like word studies. It basically means all. Okay, and what were they doing? They grumbled. Let's look at that word because the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, so we have to look it up in a Hebrew. Concordance. The word is loon, and it means to complain, to murmur, to criticize, and to whine. But nothing's worse than a little kid who's whining. But the only thing that might be is an adult who whines. My kids don't whine, they're not allowed. They're just not allowed. We, we told them that. We told them that in the womb. If you come out whining, we're going to find a way to... You can't... I don't like whining. Okay? I don't even drink wine. <laughs> you know? I just don't like it. I, it drives me crazy. If you're hurt, cry. If you're happy, laugh. Don't whine. Okay? Some of you are whiners, Right? Woe is me, right? Okay, I think of loony. You've got to be whiners or loony because they're selfishly foolish. That's what it means to be loony. Now, let's look at Numbers 14, 3 through 4, the next two verses. Why is Adonai bringing us to this land where we will die by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will be taken as booty. Wouldn't it be better for us to turn, return to Egypt? Listen, wouldn't it be better for us to... Look at the graphic stupidity of unbelief 
Look at how graphic this is. Let, let, me get, let, me, let, let me throw something at you. Hey, let's return to a land that was devastated by God. By their God, by your God. Devastated, ruined. Nothing's there. No food. The Egyptians, the ones that survived, are starving to death. Remember the locusts? You know what locusts do? They eat everything green. It was a swarm, gone, no food. Okay, how about return to a land that's still mourning for its firstborn sons? Return to a land that they had plundered on the eve of their exodus. Return by the Red Sea where the Egyptians had drowned. And what kind of reception do you think? Hey, look who's back! Come on, we'd, we'd, we'd give you something to eat, but we don't have any food. Not only that, but they said, let's appoint a leader. Let's appoint our own leader. How many of you, this is notorious down here, how many of you have been part of a church where they just kicked the guy out and appointed a new leader? Raise your hands. Raise them high, please. It wouldn't kill you, right? I can't see this. Now, if your pastor resigned, that means he was fired. So how many of you have been to a place where he kind of resigned all of a sudden out of nowhere? He was fired. He was taken into a room, and they said, look, we don't want to cause any bad blood, but it's time for you to go, so can you just say you're resigning? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Any pastor's kids? Any of your fathers been kicked in the teeth a thousand times? Okay, part of it was their fault because they worked under a system that wasn't biblical. Now, Numbers 14, 5 through 9, let's just continue with the story. It makes sense to read in context. Moses and Aaron, Moshe and Aaron, fell on their faces before the entire assembly. The entire assembled community, I'm sorry, of the people of Israel. Yehoshua, the son of Nun, Joshua, and Kalev, Caleb, the son of Yefuneh, from the detachment that had reconnoitred the land. They went in with the other ten spies, right? Tore their clothes. And said to the whole community of Israel, the land we pass through in order to spy it out is an outstanding, not it's okay, not it's good, not it's really good, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Remember what he said in Deuteronomy? You're going to go into a land and drink water with cisterns you didn't dig. Yeah. Have grapes for wine that you didn't plant the grapevines. Olives, pomegranates, you're going to have the best of the best. It's like the Garden of Eden that I set up for you. They said, it's unbelievable, you guys are crazy. What, what, we're in the wilderness, we're on the plains of Moab, all we got to do is go in there, and not only that, you don't even want to stay, you want to go back there, you want to go backwards, you want to go back? Go back to what? Oh, it was so much better when I was in the world. Really? What world were you in? Maybe it was better when you were like high as a kite, it was better for me too. It shows their heart, first of all. They fall on their faces. What do you think they're doing? Crying out to God. They can't believe it. They're like, you got to be kidding me. It's like me sometimes. I do the same thing. you got to be kidding me. How blessed do you want to be before you'll be thankful? Amen. There's some people, I'm telling you, if they won the lottery, they'd be like, i got to come and pick it up? You can't bring me the money? <laughs> spoiled. Listen, look at me. You're spoiled. I love you, but you are a spoiled brat. This country is one big drive through You're spoiled. And if you don't get it yesterday, you're miserable. Just don't rebel against Adonai. Tell, tell me to calm down. I've got to calm down. I, I begged the Lord all morning. Just, just, just let me talk. Just let me. But aren't you frustrated? Some of you older folks, don't you see? Don't you see what's going on with this new generation that's coming up? Yeah, you might, you might make an app that will make you $3 million. You might, or you might, that might not happen. You might want to try the old-fashioned route, like get an education or a trade and work hard. What? Did you say hard and work in the same sentence? It's like an oxymoron. Just don't rebel against the Lord. See, the problem is, if a leader is in place by God, 
you're not rebelling against the leader. You're rebelling against God. Now, if the leader is not in place by God, then I don't even know how he got there, but it happens, right? It happens all the time, self-proclaimed leaders. See, in the messianic movement, the way we work it is you can't just go to school and get a degree and start working. You have to start working, and people have to identify that there's an actual call. Then you start going to school. Isn't that smarter? Because maybe if you start working, you'll realize yourself, hey, this isn't for me. But then, you know, 12, 15 years in with a pension hanging over your head, you might have to stay. Yikes. Don't rebel. Let's look at that word. It's a marad, a person who just resists authority. Real simple. It doesn't matter if it's in school, cops, parents. Timothy said in the last days, kids won't even respect their parents. They'll think everything's coming to them. Ma, you were supposed to get the bigger one. What? What, what did you say? What? Burn, hold my jacket. What? The bigger one? You're crazy, parents. You're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. From one extreme to another. I had nothing, so I want to give Junior everything. Every, what do you give it? What, what? What? What do they need? How about instead of giving them something, giving them a conversation? And tell them about real life. Let's continue, if you wouldn't mind. 14, 10 through 12. Who's having fun yet? Some of you older folks are like, I like him. Some of you young people, like you 15-year-olds, like, I hate this guy. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how you could be saying one thing and one person could love you and the next person could hate you? That's when you speak the word of God and you speak truth, that's the way. Truth always divides. Truth always creates a chasm. Truth always, always, always. If it's truth, you're going to have somebody on this side of it that says, shut up. You're going to have somebody on this side that says, keep speaking. But if it's not truth, if it's fabricated, if it's every I dotted and every T crossed and just motivational, everybody's going to like you. Then you know what you are? You're a politician. <laughs> and then you get to spend other people's money. Any politicians here? Don't even raise your hand. <laughs> but just as the whole community was saying they should be stoned to death, what? This is, they just... They were just delivered three days. Now the people are all grumbling. And now they're talking about, let's not just grumble. Let's not just criticize them. Let's kill them. Listen, pay attention. You might find yourself in this story a little bit. This isn't, this isn't Israel's history. This is very applicable, guys. You know how people always want application? Pay attention. They were saying they should be stoned to death. The glory of Adonai appeared in the... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. The glory of the Lord appears in the tent of meeting. Adonai said to Moshe, how much longer is this people going to treat me with contempt? He's talking to the leader. How much longer will they not trust me, especially considering all the things I've done? Have you ever said that? Yeah. You ingrate all the things you could say to a kid, a sister, you know what I mean? It, sometimes you go, you got to be kidding me. Of all the things I've done, you're going to remember that thing that I didn't do? I had a relative one time. I did so much for this kid. So much for this kid. I got him special privileges when he was in prison because a few of my friends were the prison guards there. I visited him every week. I connected him with people. Led him to the Lord so much. One day, one day, gave him so much money. One day he wanted to buy a radio for his car. All I said was, what's wrong with the current one? Is it broken? No, Cousin Greg. I said, in my conscience, so-and-so, I can't. That was the last I heard of him. There are people who will just take. And the minute you stop giving, they have no use for you. Does anybody know what I'm saying? It's okay. You can yell out. You can yell out. Oh, that's Cousin Alvara. Yell it out. It's okay. She's not listening. You know she's not listening. It's unbelievable. And you think that the person you keep taking from doesn't know? They just don't want to admit it because they're embarrassed for themselves that this is all I am. So he says, how much longer will they not trust? And then he says, I'll tell you what. I'm going to strike them with sickness. 
So not just kill them, like they'll suffer and then die. God would do that? Which, which God do you have? The one with the white beard and the big red suit? I'm going to strike them with sickness, destroy them, and make you a nation greater and stronger than they are. In other words, we'll start fresh from your loins. Now, I could imagine Moses going, like making sure nobody's around. <laughs> you know, he's in the tent of meeting the people around. He's like, okay. But in case any of them survive the sickness, this is on you, right? This is your idea, not mine. I'm just agreeing with you. Look what he's appearing. He's got two million complaining people. They're all complaining. They're miserable, hypocritical, and they want to kill him. And he has a chance to go take him out. 90% of ministers, according to the Bonner Institution, do not finish their ministry. 90%. And only 5% of that 90 it's due to sin. The other 95% it's due to complaining, murmuring. Now, let me just say, some people might say, do we have a lot of that here? No. Thank God we don't. No, it comes every now and then, and you have to just say stop. You know, but no, thank God, no. No, I wouldn't have made it. No. But again, listen to me. Most people complain and murmur in the believing community because of their lack of, of intimacy with God, not because their lack of what goes on inside a building once a week. If this had to be my saving grace, I'd be done. My saving grace is every day getting with the Lord, spending time with him, thinking about him all the time. That's all I think about, thank God. My job allows me to think about him a lot, but does he ever leave your mind? I don't, what, what else is there to think about? Even on a vacation, I'm thinking, I'm going to get closer to you. I'm not going to vacate from you. I'm going to get closer to you. I don't go on retreats. I go on advances. So the Lord threatened to destroy the people and rise up a new nation. And look what happens. This reveals Moses' heart. It's quite beautiful. This is why he was called the most humble man. Now, humility with God is the number one character trait to have. Not false humility, not, oh, I didn't do anything, and you're looking for the compliment, and they go, no, no, it was great, and you go, no, and you walk away, and you go, <laughs> that's false humility. That's insidious pride. It's awful. Beating yourself up is stupid. Just knowing that if God is using you, you're the UZ. He's the user. That's all. That's all. Don't mess with his glory. Moses was a beautiful man. He was the most humble man on the face of the planet, right? He was called not a servant of the Lord. What's the most important thing you can do with God? Serve him, right? So he was called the servant, meaning he was the servant of all servants. If there's a king of all kings and a lord of all lords and a song of all songs, he was the servant of all servants. You got me? The servant of all servants. Now, where do we read that? In the Bible, good, good. <laughs> Getting warmer, right? Never saw it in the Cracker Jacks box at the end with the toy. Moses was the most humble. Where? It's got to be the old Exodus. No. What are we in right now? Numbers. Numbers 12. What verse? Verse 3, right? It said Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. Now, who wrote Numbers? Imagine like God's talking to him and then he takes a break from it and he goes, I'm just going to pen this in that I was the most humble man. What was that, God? I'm throw away the pen. No, it actually must have killed him to have to write that. It must have killed him to write it. Now listen to this. This is crazy. You know I love to bring stuff out, right? And you're like, how does he see it? I don't know. But I want to bring something out to you that I need you to see. However, Moshe replied, so he's replying, he's like, let's take out the people, we'll start new. When the Egyptians hear about this, and they will, do you see that? Guys, no internet, no email, no regular mail, no phones, 
there on the plains of Moab, how are the Egyptians going to hear about it? Picture, I know we're so connected, people can get us any time. This is 3,400 years ago. There's no Pony Express. How? Let me tell you how, sweet pea, because bad news travels so much faster than good news will ever travel. I wish to God in this city with 400 churches, the good news traveled as quick as the bad news. Everybody be saved. People love bad news. Did you hear? Tell me something good, Shaka. They will. Now listen to this. this. You see this guy's heart. It is spectacular. A spectacular heart of God. Because it was from among them that you by your strength brought the people out. He's telling God. He's not, he's not coddling God. He's not manipulating God. You can't manipulate God. He's saying they'll hear about it because you ransacked them. You blew them right in the water. They did not survive. You delivered these people with your mighty outstretched arm. They could never have done it by themselves. Everybody knows it was by your power. You brought them out. If you kill off these people at a single stroke, then the nations that have heard of your reputation, the nations that have heard that you're a great God, that's why he did it. He was developing and preparing people for worship. They had to know that he's a great God. God has to be big. We make God small. It's a mistake. He has to be big in order to be worshipped the way he deserves to be worshipped. He's not your buddy. I know some of you think he is. He's not your buddy. He's almighty God, not a buddy. It says the nations that have heard of your reputation will say that the reason Adonai slaughtered this people in the desert is that he wasn't able. Look at what Moses is after. He's concerned about his heavenly father's rep. You see how beautiful that is? I'm telling you, I could be walking, and if somebody says something derogatory about God, I will freeze. And I will turn and go, I'm sorry, I couldn't help to. I want to know the God you're talking about. Because that's not the God I know. There's no way I'm letting somebody talk about my father like that. You can't do that. Yes, if they could, do, why, what do you mean? They could do it. Why can't I? So now, please, let Adonai's power be as great. And when you said, where's this? Adonai's flow to anger. He's repeating verbatim the scriptures. Where? Has to be before numbers. It's Moses. It's not going to be in Hebrews. Come on, you got to start thinking. you got to use cognitive thinking. If he already said it, and we're in numbers, it has to be before numbers. Leviticus, Leviticus was all the laws. It was just the laws of God. Exodus, remember he said, show me your glory, 33, 18, 34, 6 through 7. This is what his glory was. I don't know, his power. He's slow to anger. This is who you are. You're slow to anger. You're rich in grace. You forgive offenses and crimes, yet not exonerating the guilty. You're not what some people think you are. You're not the God of cash and Cadillacs. You're not the God of Joel Osteen. It's not that. You will punish the guilty. You sure when you come back, you got fire in your eyes. It's horrible. That's why my friend was crying all night. Because there are people that will snub their nose. They don't understand. They're making a mistake. It's not a scare tactic. It's not right. It's inappropriate. All that God has done. All that God has done for us. It is not the people who have done this. The people have wrecked it. The people have polluted the nation in, in physically, emotionally, mentally, morally, and spiritually. When there was a storm when I lived in Ormond and all those needles popped up on the beach, you think God threw the needles in? When the baby's born of crack, you think God made the woman addicted to crack? When somebody's starving, how come you didn't help? You're a humanitarian. Forget God. Why didn't you help? So now it's on you. God gave us enough. We just don't share. So he says, what? when is this going to stop? Now look at the next verse. It's beautiful. Please, he's begging with an exclamation, please forgive the offense of these people according to the greatness of your grace. This is Yeshua. This is the heart of God. Please forgive. They know not what they do. I'm begging you, just as you have borne with this people from me, you know these people. They're your people. You create them. They're obstinate. They're rebellious. They're critical. They murmur. They backbite. They gossip. 
You know these people. What, what a beautiful, a true shepherd. Not to mention that God's honor was at stake. And then Rome, uh, Numbers 14 finishes with this, 29 through 30, two verses. It says, uh, he said, I'll forgive you, but your carcasses will fall in this desert. It's horrible. Every single one of you who were included in the census over the age of 20, you have complained against me, will certainly not enter the land about which I raised my hand to swear that I would have you live in it. You're not going to get in except for Caleb, Caleb and Yehoshua, Joshua. When I think about numbers, it's impossible to think numerically. But this is the craziest and the saddest numbers to me. The Bible says in Exodus that 603,550 men over 20 years old left Egypt. And two actually entered the land of Israel. It's crazy. 603,548 tombstones in the wilderness. All because they just could not keep their mouths shut and follow. Some of you have a questioning spirit. That's good. You should question when you want answers. But you know what? Be careful. Sometimes it's borderline rebellion. It's a fine line, but know the difference. Now we get to number 16, and this is the, the crescendo. Now Korah, or Korah, in the English, the son of Yitzchah, the son of Kahat, the son of Levi. You're going to see something very interesting here. He's the son of Levi, so who is he? It's Moses' cousin. Another family member. Somebody so close to him. Along with Datan and Aviram. The sons of Eliav and On, the son of Pelet, they were descendants from Reuben. Two, two men from the tribe of Reuben. They took men and rebelled against Moshe. Siding with them were 250 men of Israel, leaders of the community, key members of the council. If you want a rebellion, get some key people. And make sure if you have elders, they're key people. Get somebody who's rich, get somebody who's powerful. Because if they're rich and powerful, they'll sway the vote. They don't even have to know the Lord. They just got to be rich and powerful. Billy, you've been doing this over 50 years. You know exactly what I'm talking about. How many ridiculous, ridiculous committees did you have to sit with and they wouldn't know the Lord if they fell over them? But they were dictating. They were the key people. Key people, get the key people. So here he was, a Levite. Korah's a Levite, a priest. But he wasn't a member of the Aaronic line. So therefore he resented the family of Aaron, including Moses. Here we go again. Look, I want you to see something. Look at, look, at, look at Jude 11. Why don't we have a chapter? Because there's only one chapter. I want you to see this. If Hebrews 11 is the hall of fame, Jude 11 is the hall of shame. It says, Woe to them in that they have walked the road of Cain. Cain. They have given themselves over for money to the error of Balaam. Balaam. They have been destroyed in the rebellion of Korah. So he mentions, this is Yeshua's half-brother, very strong. If you read this letter, he said, I wanted to encourage you, he starts. I just wanted to make it nice, but there's stuff going on that i got to take a different road. And you know what the letter was all about? Grace abuse. Abusing the kindnesses of God. Taking advantage of God like some children take advantage of their parent. They love their parent. They'll sit there and whine, and, and they won't talk. And then when you go, okay, fine, I'll give it to you. I love you, Mommy. You've got to be an idiot. Oh, you didn't love me before? So, mentions three people, right? Cain, Cain's problem was he was proud and obstinate, right? Jealous of his brother, killed his brother. Balaam was egotistical and greedy, okay? But Korah was the worst of them all, because not only was Korah proud and obstinate like Cain, very proud, and was egotistical and greedy, hey, who do you think you are, Moses? But he wanted to control the lives of others. So he politicked. He got too high. He knew, I'm going to get these leaders. Because if I get the leaders, Moe's got to back down. It, nothing's changed, guys. It's the same story. Nothing's changed. Some of you work at places where there's people of influence, and they think they can control you. Well, I give $100,000 to the school, and I want my daughter to play soccer. Your daughter sucks. She's a nice girl, but 
No Pele here. I wouldn't last in that system no more than I'd last in the church system because it's a man-made system. It's not that I'm rebellious. I don't like a system made by man. What do I always tell you? Man's plans? Right. Man's plans are garbage cans. So, he was politicking. He got the leaders. Now, who do we know was the original politician? Lucifer. He politicked, I don't know how long, but he took a third of the, a third of the created angels? He must have been good. He must have been savvy. Savvy. You know, some people are just good at it. Now, Korah, Dathem, and Abiram, in the English, just so you know, it means an uncovered fountain of pride. They have three names, an uncovered fountain of pride. And why did God expose them? Because he knew their motivation. Because, guys, our God isn't working for cheap opportunists who want to make a name for themselves or to promote a man-scented gospel. No, that's not our God. And just for the record, I want you to see the incredible mercy of God in all this. Look at Numbers 16, 31, 32. This is beautiful. The moment he finished speaking, the ground under them split apart. This has never happened before. It will never happen again until the end. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households. All the people who had sided with Korah and everything they owned went down into the center of the earth, alive, screaming. Now, this is where I want you to see the mercy. It says all. Now, most people think, well, that means all of Korah's family. Well, not exactly. No. It says all who sided with Korah. That means if your mom and dad are going off on a path that is anti-God... I'll respect you, I'll love you, but I ain't going to follow it. See, it, it wasn't his whole family, because some didn't follow. How do I know that? The Bible tells me in 1 Chronicles 6. It tells me that there was a priestly line, the Vitalitical clans, and the mentions the descendants of Korah. That meaning there was, he didn't kill all the family of Korah. That's remarkable. The prophet Samuel was a descendant of Korah. This shows you God's mercy. That would be like the Americans electing a descendant of Benedict Arnold to be the president. We might be doing something worse. You see God's mercy? He had every right to just say, you know what, Cora, because of what you did, I'm destroying your whole family. Listen to me. Ezekiel, don't. Don't give me this generational, this generational curse thing has been so abused, it's pathetic. You know why they abuse it? So we don't have to be responsible. Well, it's not my fault I'm sinning. It's a generational curse. And deliverance didn't work. No, wrong. That's not what the prophet Ezekiel said. The prophet Ezekiel said, if your father is an unbelievable sinner and you repent and walk the ways of the Lord, you won't be responsible for his sin. That's what the Bible says. And that's a beautiful, beautiful truth right there. Now, let me explain something to you as we finish up. Look at number 16.3. It says, They assembled themselves against Moshe and Aaron and said to them, You take too much on yourselves. It's a ploy, manipulation. After all, the entire community is holy, every one of them. You've heard this, right? Hey, we're all priests. Okay, well, do something. Nobody's stopping you. Go to a nursing home this afternoon. Go to the prison tomorrow. Go, go on the street and street preach. Who's stopping you? You are holy. Go. That's my dream. My dream is for people to minister. It says, you take too much on yourselves. After all, the entire community is holy, every one of them, and out of noise among them. So why do you lift yourselves above the whole assembly? Look, I want to ask you a question. Is, is leadership biblical or not? Old and new or just old? You Sure. Okay, let me show you two definitions. Let me show you a theocracy. I shared this with some of the parents in the Shabbat school. And um, let me show you this definition. A theocracy, okay, is a form of government in which God is recognized as the supreme civil ruler, whereby God's laws are being implemented by priestly authority. Okay? Now let me show you what a democracy is. This is the American church. Government by the people, whereby the supreme power is in the people and exercised by them. Most pastors have said they're hirelings. They get a contract, and then this group of people decide if he's worthy. I, listen, this is crazy. I'm so naive.
because I'm so naive sometimes to the world and the church. It's so, it's so, but I learned a lot in 13 years here. Wow, I got some education, man. Wow. I met with a guy who was hired by our huge church here. He wanted to meet with me, and um, I sat with him at lunch, and I just, I just was talking. I said, so what do they expect from me? He goes, well, we're running 800, and they expect me to break 1,000. I thought I was talking to somebody like an IBM. You know what I mean? Like, so what do they expect? Well, they want me to increase my group, increase my numbers, and I was like, I was, I was mortified. I was mortified. But I, I just met the guy, so I had to just go along. And I asked him, I said, let me ask something. What would happen if it didn't grow? He said, well, chances are I'd get fired. I said, what if you lost 100 people? He said, oh, I'd definitely get fired. I go, what if the 100 people you lost were bumps on a log? They were Laodicean. They were doing nothing except getting in the way of the Holy Spirit. What if the 700 people you had left were on fire for God? What if the fathers took priestly control over their families? What if the mothers became matriarchs? What if the kids developed intimacy and started to see things and hear things, dreams and visions? What if that? He goes, it wouldn't matter. Does anybody know what I'm talking? You guys should know better. You guys used to go to church. I never did. You guys know what I'm talking? This is sick. This is insidious. Nickels and noses, is that what it comes to? <sighs> Man. Just so you know, I'm letting it out and letting it out to you and you and everybody here. Beth Yeshua follows a biblical model. Now let me explain, okay? We're going to do this one time, then it'll be on a disc or on the website or wherever it is, and then you can refer to it, you can tell your friends. So what kind of government they have? You can tell, because I don't want to repeat myself every week. Okay? We follow a biblical model with elders. They're called Zenachim, deacons, shamashim, and ministry leaders called Nogid. Now, we have a chief elder called Mashgiach Ruchani. Now, some of you have a problem calling me a rabbi because you read Matthew 23 and you read out of context. Then just call me Mashgiach Ruchani. Okay? Don't call me Greg. You don't want Greg's anointing. Greg's anointing sucks. Okay? We also have Jewish people that come in here, and they respect the rabbi. In the, in the, you got to understand, this is a messianic community. It's not a church. It's a messianic community. And in the Jewish community, rabbis are higher than doctors and lawyers. Okay? Not that way in the church. All right? I don't want to be high. I don't want to be low. I just want to flow in the calling that I have. Okay? So you have a chief elder, that's me, and then you have Zenonim elders, Joseph Marks, Joe, are you here? And David Johnson, are you here? Raise your hand. Those are our two elders. Now, you might say, why don't we have more elders? Not easy to find. Right. Let me show you why. First of all, let me show you 1 Timothy 3.1. These are called the pastoral letters. Why? Because they're letters to teach how to pastor. Here is a statement you can trust anyone aspiring to be a congregational leader is seeking worthwhile work. So let's just look at the word leader for a minute. It's Greek. We get the word in our, in our um, language, Episcopal, the presiding officer of a church or a congregation. So is it just Old Testament? Is it just Moses? No, it's obviously Paul is writing to his spiritual son and saying that these congregations, like James was the leader of the congregation in Jerusalem, the first congregation. Yeshua is half-brother, right? He was the leader. And they brought leaders down from Antioch to meet with him. You got ha Do your kids, they don't have leadership in your house? That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem with our society. So, so this, is, this is biblical. You, I just want you to understand, this is biblical, okay? Now, it says that a leader is choosing something worthwhile. Look at this word. If you, if you want to be a leader, but you can't want to be it. When people, young people come to me, I love when these young people, they're 18, they go, Rabbi Greg, I really think I'm getting a call to ministry. And I'm like, do you think it's wearing a microphone for an hour on a Sunday or Saturday? Is that what you think ministry is? Because it's not. That's not the hard part. You just got to seek the Lord for a word. That's easy. That's on him. The other stuff is the crazy stuff. I always tell them the same thing. I said, if you feel called to ministry, run away from it with everything you can. And if you end up in the belly of a big fish, you're called. Now, but just know that if you are called, it's beautiful, it's excellent, it's eminent, it's choice, 
It's precious, it's useful, it's commendable, and it's admirable. That's what the Lord says in his word. Now, next, 1 Timothy 3, 2, the next verse, it says, A congregational leader must be above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must be temperate. Faithful to his wife. I got that one down. Okay? Only because my wife makes Lorraine and Bobbitt look like a softie. No, that has, that's not true. That's not true. It has nothing to do with Bernadette. It has to do with God. If, if you're going to try to love your wife and not commit adultery, you, you're going to fail. You've got to love God so much that sin is just stupid. Yeah. Faithful to his wife, temperate. You know what temperate means? Free from wine. I'm good. Self-controlled. Well, let's go back to that one for a minute. Orderly, well-organized. Roxanne, am I well-organized? The most organized person you've ever met in your life? Yeah, uh, organization is huge to me. Huge. Um, hospitable. That means generous to guests when we have guests. Hospitable? Yeah, I stay for two hours talking to guests, of course. I'm tired. Able to teach? So the, well, then the only one Self-controlled, the, the word in the Greek means sane. So, okay, five out of six ain't bad, right? <laughs> I mean, be honest. That's, that's a pretty high percentage if you do the math. Okay. Next, let's go to sec, uh, First Timothy. So you can't, anybody just can't do this. Now, anybody can't be a shamashim. Listen, some of you shamashim. Listen to this. You wonder, why don't we just choose a warm body? That's wrong. Amen. That's wrong. I'd rather have none than be desperate and have the wrong ones. It says, likewise, the shamashim, these are the deacons, must be of good character. Okay? People whose word can be trusted. They must not give themselves to excessive drinking, meaning you're at least allowed to have some wine. Or be greedy for dishonest gain. And first, let them be tested. We don't just, you can't, you could have the greatest stellar reputation if you come here for a week. There's no way. No way. Then if they prove themselves blameless... Now, that doesn't mean if they're without sin, blameless, just like Job is blameless. That means if they strive very hard to obey God, and when they do sin, they fess up. Penitent and contrite. Let them be appointed as deacons. Now, this is the tough one. Similarly, the wives must be of good character. That's why it's so hard. <laughs> now, listen to me. Be very careful. Be very careful. I have, I worked at a congregation. I used to work here years ago. When some people in leadership, their wives were trying to control the leader. And I saw through it and I sat them down. I said, listen, I have nothing against your wives. I don't deal really with women in the sense that unless your husband is there. I don't. I don't have the authority. I don't have the authority. I am not over you. I'm just a teach. I'm just a congregational leader. All I can do is lead this congregation, teach the word of God, deal and try to reconcile but i i do not have a voice into your life do you understand i don't know how people think they do not only would i not sit with you recently i had to go see somebody a doctor and i wouldn't even see her because i know her husband now the husband trusts me emphatically that's not the issue her virtue is at stake i don't want them to talk about her you follow so I don't do it. It's not that, oh, what am I? You think, I, if I'm going to fall to that, I'm going to fall to all the trips. Oh, by the way, you want to hear something hysterical? You guys can handle it, right? Yes. If you can, who cares? Um, <laughs> last week, I took Darren Butler's son. You know Darren Butler, the worship leader? He's fairly black, right? Anyway, I'm laughing at that because when they first got here, you know, this town is very messed up. And the whole world is now. When they first got here, this is classic. She's talking to me, Terry, soon. she goes, you know, we've had some problems because, you know, I'm white and Darren's black. And I went, Darren's black? He can't come to the congregation. I'm sorry. And she went, really? And I said, you're nuts. No, but they've been here. They've been here for 12 years now. But this is the point. I took a little son. So everybody in my neighborhood knows me because New York Jews stick out in Macon, right? So I have a name. Linda, where are you? Linda lives across the street. Remember? Remember how I used to watch you going to church 95 times and finally I said, what do you, do? she goes, she says, what are you doing? Watch me. I said, I'm trying to figure out what the heck you're doing. <laughs> and now you've been here how long? Uh, here? Yeah. 10 years? Wow. And Linda's lovely. Yeah. She's the best. I love you so much. 
You don't even, you know, do you know? You know how much I love you? You, you know Janet, right? Yeah. Janet Jones, Ms. Jones, if you're nasty, you know her? So I send, I, I send Jazz to go get the mail. So she's pulling out of her, her you know, house, and she pulls right along. She rolls down the window. She's like, you know, what's this little kid with the dreads getting your mail? So I walk over to her, and I go, I said, Jazz, go, go, go in the house for a minute. And I walk up to her, and I go, look, it was a crazy night in Nairobi about eight years ago. <laughs> You know, I was there on a mission, and she's like this. Janet's like. And I said, Bernie, that's a way. This, this kid's mom shows up in Atlanta and says, he's your kid. I don't even know what to do. How am I going to tell Bernadette? that? And she's like, Rabbi. She's like panic-stricken. I said, I'm only messing with you, Janet. Are you crazy? <laughs> a crazy night in Nairobi. But what I'm saying is I don't get together with you because of a sexual reason, it's totally inappropriate. Now, you might not be married. We have women counselors. And if you do absolutely need to talk to me, then either my wife or Denise or Roxanne will be there. Amen. It's just the way I've always done it, and I'm not going to change it. I'm just not. You know? Not worth it. So, this is the issue. I saw these, these, these guys. They were totally controlled, total Ahabs. By Jezebel's. And Jezebel was trying to get to Elijah, and it was obvious. And I was like, you can't do it. So if you want to be a Shamashim, and you're going to speak, but it's like a girl's voice, you're not going to be Shamashim. You follow? She's not going to throw her voice through. You're not going to be a channel. If she wants to say something, let her say it. But she's not going to say it through you. Do you understand? The spirit of Jezebel cannot reside in Beth Yeshua. It cannot. She's taken out every time. And it's not that I'm dumb to it. I wait mercifully because you know who's going to do it? God's going to open it up and remove them. I don't have to. It's a little annoying. It's aggravating because I sit there and go, stop. Just stop. Just can't you stop? You've done this everywhere you've gone. And Jezebel will not stop till she's leading. She'll never stop. Nope. She won't stop till she leaves. So the wives must be of good character, not gossips. Because what happens is Shamashim tell their wives everything. And then their wives, you know how it works, right? They're just out with their girlfriend. Now, I heard. And it's never what they heard. Because by the time it goes in here and it bounces off the frontal lobe, goes down the paws, out the mouth, it changes. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I got a call last week from a guy who used to come here. He goes, I'm so sorry you have stage four cancer. He said it was on Facebook. What, guys, what I'm saying is, go to the source. You know who said that? Yeshua in Matthew 18. Go to the source. Stop gossiping. Stop. Okay, and I wasn't going to go over this Exodus 18. You know where it says... You got a minute? Yeah. Okay. Now, I want you to know, even though we have Shamashim, like Darren Butler is a Shamashim. The people that head up our counseling ministry, they're Shamashim. Why? A Shamashim means a servant. So they're heading up ministries. Okay? The folks that head up our Shabbat school, they're Shamashim. You follow? Why do we need them? Look at Exodus 18. The following day, Moshe sat to settle the disputes with the people while the people stood around Moshe from morning to evening. Why? Because there was a lot of disputes, a lot of people. And he's sitting there. In the seat of Moses, trying to settle disputes, right? When Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, saw that all he was doing, he said, hey, what you're doing is not, see, it's not even good to the people. Sometimes there's somebody here. Let me explain to you one more time. I know I've said this a million times, and it's never, ever, ever registered. There's going to be about 15 people who want to say hello and give me a hug. But when you come up and tell me about your hour and a half dream you had 17 years ago, those people are standing there, and they just want to say hello. Some of them drive very far, like this couple from New York. They just want to give me a hug, which I think is quite beautiful. Do you know how selfish and self-centered you are not to let them? So they stand there like yokels for 40 minutes, and then they just give up. It's not the right forum, okay? You don't go on a golf course and say, you're a doctor? What do you think about this rash? You don't do that. It's, it, you hear what I'm saying, doc? It's not right. You don't go to a lawyer and say, hey, I think I need to... 
make an appointment. It's right. It's appropriate. It's not nice. And even though you're saying, Rabbi, that's rude. No, no, you're rude. In actuality, you're offended because you never put two and two together. It's inappropriate. It's not the right time right after service. First of all, I'm spent. If you asked me a question, I couldn't answer it because everything's out of me. But there are people, I just want to say hello to some people. Miss Annie wants to give me a hug, right? She hasn't listened to a word I said in 12 years, but she likes to give me a hug. Every time I say this, somebody comes up to me. I'm telling you, he goes, I need to tell you something. Just take a minute. No such thing. No such thing. Please, just be respectful of others, not me, others. Just others. So his father says, it's no good. These people are waiting around. You're sitting there alone with all these people standing around. Moshe answered the father, it's because the people come to me. You're not the issue, Moses. They're hearing from, they want to hear from God. Whenever they have a dispute, it comes to me. I judge between one person and another. So let's continue real quick. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you're doing isn't good. You will certainly, you're going to burn out. You're going to burn out. I've been burnt out more times and it's amazing. Thank God Yeshua says a smoldering wick, he won't snuff out. I've been a smoldering wick so many times you have no idea. No idea. What you are doing isn't good. You'll certainly wear yourself out. Not only you, but the people. You wear them out. They're waiting. They just want to say hello. It's too much. Can't do it alone, you. So listen. Listen to what I have to say. I'll give you some advice, and then God be with you, meaning you don't have to take it. People, you can't force people to take advice, right? No, you know that. You should represent the people before God. Bring their case to God, meaning be the mediator. Teach the word of God. You should teach them the laws. Teach them, teach them, teach them. But you should choose from among them competent people who are God-fearing. You follow? That's why we have leadership. And that's why I don't get involved in their ministry. I don't. It's inappropriate. Because if they're leading that ministry, then they have to seek the Lord. If, I'm, if they're seeking me, then they don't have to develop an intense, intimate relationship with God. If I do hands off, then it forces them to seek the Lord. And I'm trusting God and their relationship with God. Okay, so as leader in charge, just so you know, my style is to seek God by allowing the Holy Spirit to be the thermostat, not the thermometer. I don't ask the Holy Spirit to record the temperature here. I ask the Holy Spirit to set the temperature. If I said there's a Yachad group in wherever, in Warner Robins, somebody comes to Warner Robins, I go, you're forced to go that one. I let the Holy Spirit just let it happen. I don't, I don't want to dictate in that way. My desire is presence over programs. Why don't we have a lot of programs? Because programs sacrifice people. They become programmed. Don't believe in it. I believe if we have an intimate relationship with the Lord, he'll guide us into all truth. Now, some people say leadership is man-made, and I believe they are very sincere with their assessment, but I believe they are sincerely misguided. Look at Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your lives as people who will have to render an account, meaning I have to give an account for everything I say. I shouldn't, I, you're not allowed to say as God is your witness, but I'm a Jew, so I say that a lot. So forgive me, that's why I was raised. But listen to me. I beg God. I beg God, I will do anything. I will go to any country, and you know I will. Right after that big surgery with C. diff colitis, and they said, you can't go anywhere. I went to India, the most polluted place in the world. I will go anywhere and do anything. I beg God, just don't make me a congregational leader. <laughs> Hand to God. I said, I'll do anything. Evangelism, I'll go to another country. I'll do a prison, just not a congregation. I just don't want to be a congregational leader. Because, because you have to render an account. When you're a congregational leader, you can't blow in, blow up, and blow out. You've got to pick up all the pieces. So I just didn't want to do that. See, it says you've got to render an account. I've got to render an account for everything? Everything. Now, so, so, so God's saying, make it a task of joy for them, for the leaders. Make it a joy, not of groaning. Don't, don't, if they're always groaning, maybe it's... For that is of no advantage to you. You know why? Because if God calls a leader, I'm not saying I'm called. I'm not saying I'm not called. This isn't about me. We're doing a teaching from the Torah. Okay? Just take it as that. Get me out of the picture. Stop making it personal. I hate that. We're talking about if a leader is called and you don't make it a joy for them, then you have to render the account. 
Now, if this was only in Hebrews, then I, I, I understand what you could say. Well, I don't know. That's an obscure passage. But look, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. We ask you, brothers. Now he's talking to the congregation of Thessalonica. So he's just talking about to the Jewish believers because, you know, it's in the DNA to complain. Now he's talking to the people of Thessalonica. Okay, not all Jews. He says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who are working hard among you, those who are guiding you in the Lord and confronting you, confronting. If a leader of a church is not confronting you, he's not leading. He's a hireling who's trying to keep his job. If the word of God is not exercised or infiltrated with the spirit of God, there is no confrontation. Where there's no confrontation, there's no change. None. Confront you to, in order, there it is. He's giving you the definition of confrontation. Treat them with the highest regard and love. Yes. Now, if that was just those two, now he's speaking to Timothy in the pastoral letters, 1 Timothy 5.17. You'll see it in Corinthians. You'll see it all over the New Testament. This is the last one. I don't want to, you know, belabor it. The leaders who lead well should be considered worthy of double honor. Especially, what does he hold the leader, the leader in the highest regard? Those who are working hard at communicating the word and a teach. That's the God says that's the greatest thing. We need teachers to teach. Every time Yeshua looked at the people, he wept and said, Look, sheep without a shepherd. And then it says, comma, and he sat down and began to teach. We don't need a motivational session. We need to have the word of God divided appropriately. I'm not saying I do that. Again, please don't make this personal. I know it's hard. Please, I'm giving you scripture. I'm not giving you Gregisms. Scripture. People also say we don't need to get together. Have you heard that? I don't need to get together. I could stay home. Okay, Leviticus 23.3, right in the Torah. Work is to be done on six days, but the seventh day is a Shabbat, a complete rest. I'll take my Shabbat at home. A holy convocation. Uh oh. A holy convocation. That means a called out gathering. That means called out from your home to a facility. Okay, that's Old Testament, right? Sure it is. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. Um, I'm sorry, Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Look. And let's see, so this is Hebrews, right? Now, this is New Testament, right? And let us keep paying attention to one another in order to spur each other on to love and good deeds, not neglect, neglecting our own congregational meetings as some have made a practice of doing. What do they do with that? Guys, what do they do with that? What do they do? They do with it what they do with every other scripture. They manipulate it and massage it until they get it to work for them. I don't need you to be here. You need to be here or somewhere because you're called by God to pay attention to each other and to love one another and spur each other on to do good works. Rabbi, it's hard to get together with people. It's hard to get along with people. It's hard for them to get along with you too. But this is what we're called to do so iron could sharpen iron. And sometimes that friction is good. It helps us change. It's not ugly. Don't tell me all church people are ugly. That is the most moronic, idiotic, nonsensical statement ever. You're going to tell me that Samuel and Hava and Stephen and Kenya and Arnie and said they're bums? Don't make those blanketed statements. They're not true. They're not right. Okay, but you might say, Rabbi, that's Torah and the law is nailed to the cross and this is Hebrews. They're just talking to a bunch of Jews. Let me just show you one more, Acts 2.42. You okay with Acts? Yeah. Will that work for you? They continued faithfully in the teachings of the emissaries, in fellowship. Hello? Okay, look. I met a guy, you know, <laughs> my church is in the woods, <laughs> so I just go hunting to get with God. Okay, I'll tell you what then. When you drop dead, tell your wife to go see the game warden to do your funeral, Okay. <laughs> It's funny how they come to me. Oh, can you do the funeral? Well, we, we really didn't belong anywhere. Why? Well, we were hurt. Hey, so have I. I'm still here. Amen. Find the place, not where you could be happy, where God has called you. Yeah. If God has called you here, there might be things you don't like. There's things here I don't like, but God called me here. And I ain't given up 
till he says to give up. Have some crust. Stop running. Stop running. Well, everything was good till he said something about the rapture. Really? You know how, we, you know how incredibly weak you are? That one item in eschatology causes you to run? I get emails, Rabbi, I agree with 99.9%, but you said, how critical. What a crazy critical spirit. You want me to put you under the microscope? There might be some changes coming. If the Bible kept recording events, my question to you before I leave to depart for a couple of weeks is, would you be found in Jude 11 or Hebrews 11? It's one or the other. It's no gray. It's black or it's white. Guys, count your blessings. The rabbis of old, you know what they used to say? If you lost a toe, thank God you have a foot. If you lost a foot, thank God you have a leg. If you lost a leg, thank God you have another leg. You know, you don't know what you got till it's gone. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Count your blessings. Count your blessings. Stop looking for more and be thankful for what you have. Sometimes I think I was happier with the $24,000 salary and with just a few people. It was just nicer. Everybody didn't expect you to be at their beck and call at the same time. It's impossible. You don't need me anyway. You don't need me. I'm not the issue. You need the Lord. If you have an abundance right now, praise the Lord. If you're just getting by, praise the Lord. Count your blessings and figure out how to be content. Instead of focusing on what we don't have, let's focus on what we do have and be thankful. Look, this is the bottom line. Psalm 113. This is my story, and this is your story. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the rubbish heap in order to give him a place among princes. I mean, royalty. I know we don't see it now because the world shuns us because some of us aren't wealthy and, um, and we don't have um, uh, brilliance and we don't have power. Guys, God's not impressed with that. If you have it, praise the Lord. But that's not what he's looking for. Mm-mm. You're, you're part of a royal line. You're grafted into a royal line. I know it doesn't look like that because, because all this stupid social media. Let me tell you something. Every time those kids take a picture and they put it on Instagram, they're no way as happy as they look in that picture. It's a big facade. But with the Lord, with Almighty God as your Father, well, what more do you want? What more do you want? With God coming down in human form and, and be just tortured for your benefit, what, what more do you want? He can't give you anything better than that. And you have to come to grips with it because things are going to change. It's not going to be hunky-dory in the near future. And that's what you're going to have to hold on to. That's going to have to be a reality that he's coming back. And if that's not your reality... You're in for the rude awakening. And I'm trying to prevent that from happening for you because I love you and I care about you. Be thankful. Be thankful. Why me and not my sister? I don't talk about predestination. No. My, my theory on that is your destination is predetermined by your choice. That's my theology. It was presented to me. By the grace of God, I made a choice, and I've never looked back. I'm just happy to be counted among the royal line. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Only God can take you from the junkyard and bring you to the showroom floor.
that we have to be thankful for. Let's stand together. When I travel, I could go away for two weeks. Some of you have traveled with me. I'd bring a little bag. That's it. They would say, where's your other stuff? So Bernard that called yesterday and said, look, just do me a favor. Just bring your own toothbrush at least. <laughs> it's like, okay. Fine. Yeah. It's going to be great. I'm looking to get some answers. I think I'm going to get some. So I'll see you in a little bit, right? Hopefully. Hopefully. We'll see. If not, it's good knowing you. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yevarecha Adonai v'yishmarecha Yevarecha Adonai v'hunecha Yisa Adonai ponovelecha Viasem lecha shalom. I love you. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>